Wholesale is Rob Short, Wholesaler Mastermind. And you may be thinking to yourself, Rob, you're thinking, what do you have besides this amazing podcast? And I'm so glad you asked. Wholesaler Masterminds has an assortment of product and services all designed around the art, science, and lifestyle of wholesaling. As an example, we have coaching services designed to help you power wash your practice, whether you have two years or 22 years. We'll offer you speaking live engagements at divisional or national sales meetings. Our scheduling service has dedicated professionals trained in the art of getting you more appointments, wholesaler mastermind schedulers. Our speakers bureau brings you amazing speakers and processes to get better return on investment out of those speakers. And finally, our partnership, our newest partnership with Alego. If you have Alego and want to get the wholesaler masterminds channel on your Alego platform, please let us know. Wholesaler masterminds, Happy to bring you this podcast and so much more. Wholesaler Masterminds, the art, science, and lifestyle of wholesaling. Wholesalers, how much has the world changed since you began your wholesaling career? Oh, sure. You, you, you might have been just promoted off the desk. Heck, you, you may still be on the desk. And, and, and maybe it hasn't changed so much for you. But if you're a 45-year-old wholesaler, a 55-year-old wholesaler, some of our brethren that are 65 years old, now, things are changing, and, and, and there's, there's an evolution taking place uh, in some of our peers in the wholesaling community as well as in the advisors that we serve. It's this amazingly robust, rich, uh, emergingly powerful thing called millennials, and we're going to explore that today. Welcome to the only podcast on the planet dedicated to exploring the art science and lifestyle of wholesalers and their leaders. This is the new Wholesaler Masterminds radio show. I'm your host, the founder of Wholesaler Masterminds, Rob Shore. Wholesalers, welcome back to the new Wholesaler Masterminds radio show. Now, my guest today may not be a millennial as defined by his age, but Jeff Fromm is the millennial marketing guy. Jeff's the president of Futurecast, a marketing consultancy that specializes in millennial trends, and he's also a contributing writer at Forbes.com. He's a frequent speaker on marketing, consumer trends, and brand innovation, and he spent significant time researching millennials and is the co-author of Marketing to Millennials and Millennials with Kids. Jeff has more than 25 years of marketing consulting experience with dozens of brands ranging from Build-A-Bear to Whole Foods Market. He's a member of the board of directors at Three Dogs Bakery, Service Management Group, Change Labs, and Tickets for Less. Jeff is a graduate of the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania, remains actively involved in the alumni network, and is a regular content contributor. Jeff Fromm, welcome to the new Wholesaler Masterminds radio show. Thank you. Appreciate the opportunity. Really good to have you here. As I mentioned in the pre-work, I was seeing your writings on LinkedIn. You have a robust LinkedIn following, and I identified you as an expert that could help us in the financial services community, specifically in distribution, understand more about millennials, how they think, how we should be approaching them differently than we've approached other generations. So let's start with some definitions. Just let's start at the baseline. If if you could indulge us, please define millennials. Why are they so important? What sort of impact are they having on the economy? Sure. So, Some people prefer a definition that is age-based, so we could say born between 78 and 95. Uh, We prefer to look at the millennial mindset, which looks at uh, youth trends that are impacting Xers and boomers in addition to other millennials. And we can come back to that if you'd like. So on an age basis, um, there is not a uniform agreed upon definition, but we think that a lot of people in the industry would sort of agree on 78 to 95 by birth here. And, and they're, they're, they're a robust sum of the population. Is it true that roughly 25% of the population at this juncture is, is millennials? Yeah, I think that's pretty close. Um, I haven't sat down and tried to recalculate, you know, percents and, and all that, but up somewhere between 25 and 30% probably of the U.S. pop is millennial by birth here. And if you're going in and, and you're, you're thinking about you know, this has been my approach. Let's say this has been my approach with a financial advisor. I'm used to approaching financial advisors in this manner because financial advisors historically for me have been more baby boomer 
versus millennial. Let's talk about some things that are inherently different about how you approach a millennial, how you earn trust with a millennial, how you communicate with a millennial, how you market to a millennial. So if we could start to unpack some of those things, that would be tremendously helpful to our audience. I think if I were to start the conversation and was asking anyone in your audience, what does ABC stand for if you're in a sales role, they'd all have a common answer, and that answer would be? Always be closing, baby. You bet. And with millennials, the new ABCs are not always be closing. It's always be collaborating. And millennials are about collaboration, which means that today's modern financial advisor really has to think differently. I can't tell you how many times I sit down with someone to work on you know, sort of long-range planning, whether it's legal, financial, accounting, whatever. It's like, oh, cool. Do you have any videos I could show my you know, young adult children uh, that sort of explain all this? It's like, no. It's like, really? I mean, they pretty much live off of video content. So um, there are just so many ways to be collaborating with today's modern consumer. And I think as an industry, this industry is generally not on the leading edge of best practices. So ABC needs to be reimagined as a starting point. Um, I don't buy into the fact that millennials aren't going to want relationships with people uh, because I've seen enough data to suggest if there's added value, they will. Now, they may not pay the same fees that were getting paid 20 years ago, but then nobody's paying those fees today anyways. Um, so that's a whole other conversation. Let's talk a little bit about um, the building trust piece. And the, the Always Be Collaborating is fascinating. And the, the method by which we're communi communicating messages, such as video, equally fascinating. I want to talk for a moment about how we begin to establish trust. So let's, let's, let's start to address that, if we will. So you know, the, the, the advisor has granted us an opportunity to come into their office. And, and maybe there was a way that I was used to uh, working through uh, the getting to know you, the question sequence, the building trust sequence with an older advisor. Here I am with a younger advisor. Is it different? Should I approach them any differently? Because I heard you say relationships are still important, and that's good. But should I begin to approach the relationship any differently? Should I be attacking it from a different direction or asking different questions? Um, I think that uh, there's no one specific answer. We did uh, grant uh, some of our thoughts, I guess, if you will, in an interview format with Forrester, who was sort of looking at the new millennial B2B buyer. So if we're talking about millennials who are advisors by birth year, so we're talking about you know, maybe an advisor in their early 30s, late 20s, um, I think they're going to expect a, a variety of things, um, transparency, uh, business values that align to my values. So does the, does the company you work for have values that are aligning? Uh, conscious capitalist brands tends to have an advantage. Um, having some common networks, you know, in LinkedIn, gee, I see you know several people that I'm pretty friendly with. They seem to trust you. That's helpful. Um, I do think um, that uh, their, their expectations are going to be fundamentally similar in the sense that uh, on the tr on, when we did research, if there isn't trust, there's no chance for a business relationship. The flip side is there's not a lot of gain. It's like it's, it's a yes, no. I either do or I don't. And if I don't, it's a penalty. And if I do, then great. You now have a chance. It does. It's a hunting license kind of a thing. So I, I kind of look at it as one of those things where it's like you have to have it to be in the game, but it's not going to be enough to give you a win. Which is really interesting because with, with a different generation, trust could form the bedrock of everything. And, and what I hear you saying, trust here is just the ticket in. It's a, it's a hunting license. It's the ticket in. If you don't have it, you don't play. And if you have it, you'll get some of the business, but it's not going to be enough. You're going to need more. You're going to need other things that are added value that would cause me to say, wow, I'd really love to work with you. Let's talk about conscious capitalism because I, I think I know where you're headed and maybe some of our audience does but not completely. So what is conscious capitalism? What does that mean to, to the millennial, and how are you defining it, please? So to a millennial, conscious capitalism is it's great to make a profit, uh, and there are a lot of brands that do. But there are brands that make a profit that treat their employees well, that treat their communities well, that treat their vendors well, that, that care about their supply chain. And so we could look at a brand like Starbucks, which, Starbucks, which is wildly popular with millennials, and we could say, wow, 
you know, there's a simple business model, and and they do treat, you know, their employees have better, uh, let's say, wages and benefits than the average employee who works for that kind of a business, you know, sort of restaurant, casual, QSR kinds of concepts. So, um, you know, in a corporate world, you know, what is your company and what are you doing t- to make the world a better place? That's in addition to, you know, having great services, having great technology, having great customer support. And and there's a lot of transparency that's expected among this buyer. So, you know, if you have that kind of a culture, it's great. The flip side is there are a lot of companies that say that and you go to Glassdoor and the people leaving the company say nasty things. So if I go to Glassdoor and people say nasty things, you're going to get a big penalty for that. Big penalty. So in the course of formulating how I would want to present my company to a millennial financial advisor, I'm, I'm well served to speak about things that are, um, as you say, conscious capitalism based. I'm, I'm well served to tell them more about the firm's philanthropic efforts. Uh, those things. I, I, would, I would focus on the core to start. I mean, if I was in this role, let's say I was working to sell into that, this market, I, you know, here are the products we offer, here are the services we offer, here's the sort of support you can get, here's, the, here's what you can expect of us. Um, by the way, you know, everyone in our company took last Thursday off to read, you know, to read to kids who are behind at the reading level at the schools that are in our, you know, our neighborhood or, you know, just a little more human approach in terms of making the world a better place. Okay. Um, and I'm giving you a sort of simple analogy, but I, I don't think it means they don't care about the products you sell or they don't care about the fees or they don't care about the customer sort of the technology. They want all that. But in a world where I can find lots of things that are remarkably similar in quality i think it's pretty important to find uh to find a way to bring that into the conversation in an appropriate and small way yeah i mean the focus no i appreciate what you're saying i mean we're all looking for the edge so if if all the other stuff if you will has us in some way bobbing in the sea of sameness but this particular fact will help for that particular a potential buyer, in this case the millennial, rise us above the sea of sameness, then that's a valuable uh, thing to know about to weave into the conversation. Yeah, there are three key ingredients to weave into the conversation. One is going to be that purposeful gene that your company is making the world a better place. Two is going to be the innovation gene. What is your company doing to bring usefulness to my client base? And then finally, how is it unique? And more unique products, more unique services give you some pricing authority. And they want to try to have that in their world. So those are the three areas I would typically at a high level without having done research specifically on this category, specifically with, you know, one of the major wirehouses on it. Those are the three buckets we would typically find where there's opportunity for building relationship and and driving sales growth. So that's super helpful. Let's talk a little bit more about two of the three because I think we touched on one. Uh, and that is the purposeful gene. Innovation gene, how much do millennials uh, uh, demand, if you will, to use that word, um, innovation, and, and what is innovation, what does it feel like? In other words, how, how innovative do I need to be? So innovation is defined as the useful new, and it's the secret ingredient among all the super high-performing, high-profit brands. So I'm going to say it's pretty important in terms of sales. We've looked at it through a brand brand lens, not a sales lens. But whether we're talking about Tesla, Apple, Google, or a food company like Honesty, you know, and innovation means everything from supply chain to communications. You can change the innovation quotient by creating video content on things that were traditionally sent via email newsletter to somebody who wants short form video. That's a simple basic step. You can change the innovation quotient by having useful tools for me that allow me to better serve my client. But the useful new is the definition, and the bar is high. Lots of times I hear people say, well, we want to be more like Tesla, Google, et cetera, et cetera. And it's like, okay, do you understand what they're doing to constantly bring value to the clients they serve? And just so I was clear, you called it useful new N-E-W, correct? Yep. Got it. Okay. That's my personal definition of innovation through the lens of having conducted a lot of this research. Yeah. And so the first one is purposeful gene. The second is innovation gene. 
And how do we differentiate unique gene from innovation gene? How do we separate those two? Uniqueness tends to be um, a cons on the consumer side more, but unique means that it's allowing me to curate my personal identity at some level. I'm aligning to that brand. So Starbucks has, has a strong, unique gene. Otherwise, nobody would be willing to pay $5 for that coffee. And there are experiences like, for example, Marriott is a you know, hotel where I feel like it's a little bit maybe more unique than the average hotel, and so I'll pay a small premium. So to the extent the product's a little different, the service experience is a little different, the technology's a little different, something about that is a little different, um, then it's got some uniqueness, and there's a body of research out of Harvard Business School that suggests uniqueness will drive a little pricing authority. If I don't think you have any amazing stuff available, um, then there's no uniqueness, and then there's no pricing authority. It could be, hey, you have someone amazingly talented at your firm who's developing these products, or you have a proprietary methodology uh, that, that makes it really interesting, or you have a guarantee or warranty on service performance. We're going to get back to you within X hours or whatever it is. But anything that gives you a little bit of uniqueness does help. And pricing authority here is critical because, you know, from the wholesaler to the advisor – there's a, a, a similarity in pricing. And then, of course, from the advisor to the consumer, there's a similarity of pricing. It could be, you know, 20 basis points, 25 basis points, or the difference between, you know, a 12 basis point ETF and a six basis point ETF. But, but what you're saying is those are not enough to move the meter necessarily unless there's some uniqueness that also comes into the mix. Yes, that's right. Let's talk about communication. Uniqueness is an important ingredient uh, for many brands. It's also how I, you know, feel about myself in a way, right? Like uh, there are times where I, w I just want to go with someone that's, or a brand that I per perceive to be a little bit unique and different. And so I, I'll spend a little bit more for that. Let's, let's talk about communication strategies. So when you're, when you're wishing to either initially get in front of or continue the dialogue with a millennial. Um, can you help us uh, kind of wade through some of the either either myths or truths about uh, millennials? So, so one one example. I, I remember listening to a podcast, and I heard I heard someone say that uh, uh, you know they they can't even relate to picking up a phone to speaking to someone, which is inherently problematic in our world uh, of wholesaling. So how do we begin to wade through a little bit, you know, what, what do they prefer and what do they really disdain when it comes to communication? Sure. So, you know, first of all, not all millennials are broke, unemployed, living in their parents' basements among a collection of participation trophies they've never effing earned. That's absurd. Um, millennials absolutely will read email. Uh, millennials are a texting generation because they grew up with the technology, so it's fair to say that they do prefer texting to, to calls, but they're certainly willing to make calls for business purposes. And anytime they can get, um, you know, something that's in a format that's helpful to them, then they're going to prefer that. So um, as far as communication goes, it depends on what the topic is. So in terms of, of, of business communication, sales communication, um, prospecting, any guidance in that? Um, you know, I, I guess I, I, I prefer personally when I'm doing things to send something that establishes thought leadership. So that could be something you've written or something somebody else wrote with a little note uh, to help establish thought leadership. That's a personal thing for me. Um, I, I tend to like using email because it's a little less intrusive, uh, especially if I have something super relevant. And then, you know, try to try to use some kind of CRM system. I personally use Salesforce to be able to make sure I'm not forgetting what was discussed in the past because it's pretty rude to have a conversation with someone where you don't remember what you discussed last time you talked to them a month or two ago. So, yes. you know, I, I think there's sort of expectations around making this more personal. And to the extent it's more personal, I think you're going to probably have more success. There was something that I read, and I apologize if I, if I read it on your site or read it while doing some other homework in anticipation of talking to you about millennials. And it, it was the notion of um, uh, this generation's uh, familiarity with, comfort with doing 
uh, online research, doing uh, their own investigation and fact finding and how that plays into the decision making. And I suppose that fits a bit into the whole transparency notion, right? Because if you're not transparent, you will be found out because this is a generation that will Google everything if we don't all already, but they're particularly adept. Is that a fair statement? It is a fair statement that they're pretty good at digging in and finding things and transparency is very important and you can get a big penalty if you don't, if you don't uh, behave as a brand in a transparent way. The last thing I want to dive in on is uh, chapter four in your book talks about um, building a listening and participation strategy. And there are a couple things like engagement versus interruption and interaction versus reaction. And I don't know that we have time to pick apart um, all five of these, but can you, can you walk us through a little bit about what that chapter speaks to and some, some nuggets that we can take away from our learning with you that'll help us communicate more effectively? I apologize. I don't have the book in front of me, and I have written three books. So that's okay. It's a, it's a, it's a question I can't answer off the top of my head. But I would, I would say this: uh, the the point of that was to try to get people to unlearn and reimagine sort of old models versus new models. And the idea is you have a consumer co-creator and a, uh, an executive who wants to participate and be involved. And so, you know, think about how this is changing and playing out in the average company in in this country right now, right? There are more female executives earning over $100,000 than ever before. There are more people looking for more information. So if you have niche expertise in financial services, but you don't have content that reflects that niche expertise, then shame on you. Uh, Because I make my choices based on what I am consuming in the way of content, whether that's written content or video content. And frankly, I need to have sort of a a, a benign view toward having my content expressed in lots of different ways such that um, my expertise is available to anyone in the format they want it in. So the point of the, um, the idea of sort of old model versus new model was to get people to start to think about the fact that uh, we're entering an era where the consumer has, and in this case, the, the business person has a lot more access to more information, and you better be prepared to play your cards differently. Let me ask you one last question before I let you go, and, and I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit, and, I'm, and it has to do with financial services as a whole, not necessarily just wholesalers working with financial advisors. But I heard you say something at the beginning of the show. We were talking, you were talking about ABC, always be collaborating. And, and I heard you say something which I agree wholeheartedly with, and so do most people listening to this, I know. And that is the financial service community isn't exactly on the cutting edge when it comes to things that uh, help us collaborate more effectively and efficiently. If you were to cite a couple of uh, things that the financial services community could do differently in their pursuit to touch millennials, what would you cite? And I know some of them you may have referenced and we might be rehashing a couple things or more than a couple things you talked about. But if you could kind of put them in a, in a summary statement, what, what would it be? I mean, if I was trying to engage this, this cohort, I would want to make sure I understood the unmet needs they had. So I'd want to listen first. Um, and then after that, I'd want to approach uh, things, you know, with more personalized communication, with more relevant communication. And I'd, I'd, I'd probably start with trying to add value through things that I was providing them as opposed to, you know, let me stop in, buy you lunch, take you out for the long lunch and try to go old school with uh, what I'll call traditional networking techniques to, to win the day. There needs to be some depth and breadth, or they'll suss out that you don't have anything that's particularly interesting and relevant. Mm -hmm. Jeff, I appreciate you spending time with us today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Wholesalers, come back next time for another episode of the Wholesaler Masterminds radio show. You'll find all of our content at wholesalermasterminds.com, and the podcast can be found at iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play. Mm -hmm.